Renaissance people. If you are enjoying the Italian Renaissance podcast, I have good news. We're now active on Patreon. You can show your love for the show by becoming a patron and get access to additional resources, information, and artworks. Better yet, those who join the Renaissance Master or Renaissance Patron tier will get access to at least one additional podcast episode each month. My goal is to ensure that the main podcast remains a free, accessible source for everyone. Become a patron today through the link in the show notes to support the continued production of new episodes and help build and maintain this community. The Italian Renaissance Shop is now also active on Etsy, linked in the show notes. Sport our logo or choose from a growing selection of Italian art-inspired designs. Discounts are offered to select Patreon tiers as well. Your support has my immortal gratitude. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Italian Renaissance Podcast, where we discuss essential topics about the art and culture of 15th and 16th century Italy. I'm your host, Lawrence Cianangeli. Andiamo avanti. Leonardo da Vinci is a very exciting historical figure to talk about. But before we get started with today's episode, I would like to urge you all to follow the podcast on Instagram and or Facebook to get some extra information on the topics we cover, as well as images around some of the art we discuss. Also, if you would like to support the show, you can do so directly by the links in the show notes. Lastly, I'm very interested to know what topics you guys have enjoyed so far, what you would like to see covered in the future, or what topics you would like to discuss more thoroughly. So I encourage reaching out directly through my email that's that's linked with the show notes, or by commenting on any of the social media platforms where the show posts images regarding the, the various content covered in the episodes. I'm really excited about how much the show is growing, and I want to make sure that it continues to support your guys' interests. It is impossible to talk about the Italian Renaissance without thoroughly discussing Leonardo da Vinci. Last month, we celebrated his uh, birthday on the 15th of April, and his death anniversary was this month on the 2nd of May. I want to make a quick note that when talking about artists or historical figures from any variety of Romance languages, probably other languages too, if they're referred to as somebody of a place, da Vinci, then we don't need to treat that place as a last name when discussing said figures. What I mean is da Vinci simply means that he is Leonardo of the town of Vinci. So calling him da Vinci sounds quite weird in those terms. So I refer to him as Leonardo, as should you, if you're ever talking or writing about him, okay? We know Leonardo primarily is one of the greats of Renaissance painting, though to discuss him fully would require experts in every major field of knowledge. He worked in anatomy, botany, engineering, sculpture. He was a draftsman, painter, inventor, and ardent observer of the natural world. He was even often occupied with the intricacies of hydraulics and flight. His sense of naturalism will be the main component of our talk today. Leonardo was actually born in Anchiano, a town near Vinci, in 1452. Both of these were contained within the Republic of Florence. Let me remind you that in this period there is no Italy, so to speak, but a collection of republics and communes that make up the Italian peninsula. Some important powers were, as we've discussed, the Republic of Florence... Milan, the Republic of Venice, the Papal States, and way in the south, the Kingdom of Naples. As any mildly observant listener might know, Leonardo produced was likely the most famous painting in Western history, the Mona Lisa, that you'd find today in Paris in the Louvre. Other known works of his are his Last Supper in Milan. I've got some interesting things to say about that. His sketch of the Vitruvian Man based on the Roman architect Vitruvius, who we recently discussed in relation to Venetian architect Andrea Palladio. I have also mentioned his Madonna and Child with St. Anne in relation to his compositional form. Remember, we talked about the Renaissance Triangle, which I hope listeners have since familiarized themselves with. 
He learned much of his artistic craft in the workshop of a very notable painter and sculptor named Andrea del Verrocchio. All right, bear with me, guys. Now, with him, we call Verrocchio. Del Verrocchio, meaning uh, of the true eye, right? Vero Occhio, some Italian for y'all. Though, that's simply the last name of one of his chief patrons and not a reference to his ability as an artist. So, he's not called Vero Occhio because of his true eye for aesthetic beauty. It's just the last name of, of a patron he served and he was given the nickname Verrocchio in light of that. And he's more famous as a sculptor rather than a painter. It has been suggested that the young Leonardo da Vinci is featured in Verrocchio's Bronze David, which is a work often looked at against Donatello's own Bronze David that we discussed quite thoroughly. Do you see how all of these threads are connecting? For our purposes, the most interesting part of the story of Leonardo and Verrocchio treats a painting that the pair worked on together called The Baptism of Christ, today in the Uffizi Gallery in Florence. The greater majority of this work was completed by Verrocchio, including the figure of Christ and John the Baptist. But if we look at the two angels in the lower left of the painting, there are stark differences that show the disparity between master and pupil. I urge you all to look at this work which I will also post on the joint accounts in the future. I'll tell you now, the angel on the left was done by the hand of the young Leonardo, who so finely reduces the line thickness and carefully blends the contour and shadow in the face. You can see that if you look at the two angels, the lack of hard, bold lines in Leonardo's angel to the left, right? The hair, too, is different in that... uh, It doesn't come down with such hard strokes, but it flows. Leonardo is fascinated by the flow of water, and particularly the vortex, as we can often see him emulate that in his paintings and drawings. So there are parallels between that and the hairs of this angel. Remember, Leonardo will eventually develop the sfumato technique, blurring the edges of figures and shapes in order to better depict nature, or how the eye perceives images. Maybe Leonardo Leonardo needed glasses if everything you saw was blurry. I don't know. In any case, his fumato technique does more accurately depict how we see images and emulate that in painting. In any case, it is fair, in my opinion, to call him a man ahead of his time But we have to account not only for his exceptional ability, but also his failures and how those are omitted from his legendary status. There's no doubt that he was very famous in his own time, but we have to distinguish between Leonardo the myth and Leonardo the man. He died in 1519, working in the court of King Francis I of France. Francis I of France. A little triple F here. (laughs) There he was given the title of first painter, architect, and engineer to the king. This is a landmark moment, guys. Uh, Having a court painter was not commonplace, and soon after the great courts around the Mediterranean would want their own Leonardo, so to speak, meaning their own court painter, artisan, what have you. But can we guess who might be responsible, at least in part, for the mythic status of Leonardo da Vinci? Giorgio Vasari, to be sure. I'm going to read from Vasari here, just to give an idea of how he writes about Leonardo. I am reading from my Oxford edition of Giorgio Vasari's Lives of the Artist. And he says this, of the life of Leonardo da Vinci, Florentine painter and sculptor, The greatest gifts often rain down upon human bodies through celestial influences as a natural process, and sometimes in a supernatural fashion, a single body is lavishly supplied with such beauty, grace, and ability that wherever the individual turns, each of his actions is so divine that he leaves behind all all other men, and clearly makes himself known as a genius endowed by God, which he is, 
rather than created by human artifice. Men saw this in Leonardo da Vinci, who played, uh, excuse me, who displayed great physical beauty, which has never been sufficiently praised, and more than infinite grace in every action and of ability so fit and so vast that wherever his mind turned to difficult tasks, he resolved them completely with ease. Isn't that something? Leonardo is presented to us by Vasari as seemingly some ancient Greek hero, gifted by the gods, not only in ability, but even in his own appearance. Through Vasari, a lot of Renaissance artists are given this mythologized origin. Their talent, instead of being shown as a result of years of diligent practice, are told as being divine gifts that they've just happened to have. Michelangelo Buonarroti would promote this myth for himself even, destroying a great many of his own preemptive works to get rid of any traces of his artistic process in order to promote the illusion of divine genius. We can think back to Leonardo's master, Verrocchio. Vasari also tells us a humorous tale, but likewise mythological or mythologized. Not that it might not have happened, but that it aggrandizes Leonardo as a sort of prodigy. I'm going to read this account between Leonardo and Verrocchio according to Vasari. Vasari says, As mentioned earlier, Leonardo was placed in this profession by Ser Piero during his youth in a shop of Andrea del Verrocchio. At the time, Andrea was completing a panel showing St. John baptizing Christ, in which Leonardo worked on an angel holding some garments, and although he was a young boy, he completed the angel in such a way that Leonardo's angel was much better than the figures of Andrea. This was the reason why Andrea would never touch colors again, angered that the young boy understood them better than he did. Hmm. So Vasari is implying, or deliberately saying, that Verrocchio quit painting in light of having immediately been overtaken in skill by a young and novice Leonardo da Vinci. I believe this is supported only in that we cannot date any paintings by Verrocchio beyond the baptism of Christ, in or around the same time, yes, um, but he was more generally concerned with sculpture anyway. But can you believe the drama? The crafty hand of Leonardo was so good that the master Verrocchio put away his brushes forever. I can believe it, but we can, in the very least, thank Verrocchio for helping cultivate Leonardo as we've received him, mythologized or not. Excelling in painting for Leonardo came as a result of his intense and labored interest in naturalism, the act of trying to produce images to emulate nature. Essential in understanding him is his understanding that art and science rely upon each other. He independently and unapologetically explored this relationship, investigating nature as a scientist and expressing it as an artist. For Leonardo, they were simultaneously independent of each other, yet still intimate with one another. Luckily for us, he wrote his thoughts extensively in his notebooks, which have been thoroughly translated and are available. I highly recommend obtaining a copy of his written works, as they're essential to understanding his process, and they give insight on how to interpret his works. While they are widely available for those who want to read them in English, I would recommend Leonardo on Painting, translated by, by Martin Kemp from Yale University Press. This edition consolidates and translates just about everything essential that Leonardo wrote about um, on painting and the relationship between science, art, and nature, but also on painting as a science of itself, because Leonardo believed painting to be a science. My sense is that you're not tired of hearing me read yet, so here comes a fun set of lines from Kemp's translation of Leonardo himself. Leonardo says, If you scorn painting which is the sole imitator of all the manifest works of nature, 
you will certainly be scorning a subtle invention, which with philosophical and subtle speculation considers all manner of forms, sea, land, trees, animals, grasses, flowers, all of which are enveloped in light and shade. Truly, this is science, the legitimate daughter of nature. You see, for Leonardo, painting in his own words, is the sole imitator of nature, which also makes it divine. Think about that whenever you're looking at a work by Leonardo. He also noted light and shade. Do we remember that term, chiaroscuro? That's what he's talking about. That is one of the ways in which you can render a painting more natural. We also talked about how Botticelli expertly included a large variety of local plant life in his Primavera. Leonardo does the same in his painting from around the same period, the Annunciation, in the Uffizi Gallery today. Take a look at it, and you will see the variety of flora in the garden of the Virgin Mary to really get a sense of how Leonardo works his botanical knowledge into his paintings. Again, viewing nature as divine and painting as attempting to emulate the divinity of nature. Does that make sense? I think that's why he had such a difficult time completing his works. There are roughly 15 paintings attributed to Leonardo, the Salvador Mundi painting being one of the more highly debated works, but there's no access to it, given that it's somewhere hidden in Saudi Arabia, supposedly by the, uh, the, excuse me, the crown prince Mohammed bin Salman. So we don't know where that is, and we don't have access to study it close enough to make those distinctions, though the it seems the art history world is split down the middle on the case of the Salvador Mundi. In any case, this is a very small number of works, 15, maybe 16, and many of them are incomplete, such as his Adoration of the Magi, also in Florence. If we look to Milan at his famous Last Supper, we can see a clear example of where Leonardo the scientist falls short of the myth. I'll give you all some more Italian here. The Last Supper would be called the Cenacolo. Cenacolo. Remember that because Cenacolo is not simply a single work by Leonardo da Vinci, but a collective body of works of Italian Renaissance paintings that can be cross-examined. We would look at different Cenacoli, or the Cenacolo of Ghirlandaio, for example, versus In any case, he was always the experimenting and Leonardo trying to innovate, compare them, often at the cost of time and the them. patience of his patrons. Vasari comments on this, too. I don't want it to seem like Vasari solely aggrandizes him. He does criticize him for his uh, lack of effort sometimes. But Leonardo famously took an exceptional amount of time to complete commissions and often never finished them. He was commissioned by Ludovico Sforza, the Duke of Milan, around 1495, for the Church of Santa Maria delle Grazie. This is the fresco for the Last Supper, this Cenacolo, uh, which is currently in a very fragile state and has been since not long after its creation, even though this is one of the cases where he did complete the work. But in his meticulous need to emulate nature in painting, the fresco technique was not ideal for him. So uh, the fresco being painting wet plaster with a standard pigment so they become a permanent part of the wall. Instead, Leonardo opted to try his typical oil paints, which are not sustainable means for long-lasting fresco. But he thought he would be able to enhance the fresco technique and draw out more vibrant color with his innovation innovative approach that didn't work. He thus painted with oil and tempura on a dry layer of plaster, which enabled humidity and mold to effectively separate his brilliant and vibrant colors from the wall, resulting in a poorly detailed and dull work very soon after its completion. Now, over the years, plenty of additional damages have happened from various restoration efforts and unfortunately, wars, but neither hardly as deteriorating as Leonardo's imperfect process 
even if the works shows his mastery over linear perspective. Are we starting to see a bit of this mythic veil fall back a little? Not that I want to reduce the incredible impact Leonardo had in his own time and in ours. So let's go a little further. Let's move away from painting and look at Leonardo da Vinci as an inventor, an engineer. I recall studying Leonardo while working on my master's degree and being completely floored by a sketch of a war chariot design that he had come up with. I urge you all to look this up. The drawing is of two varieties of horse-drawn chariots where, if I can read the image properly, the wheels act as a pulley system for a series of spinning blades so you can send the horses running against the line of enemy soldiers and have it chop them up for you like a helicopter blade, right? Absolutely incredible. Would it work? I don't know. But definitely look that image up because it's really, really interesting. Feeds the imagination quite a bit. Likewise, he was extremely interested in flying machines, so much so that he would actually build them and test them. Imagine Florence, if you will, a city situated in a deep valley surrounded by rolling Tuscan hills and the, the Apennine mountain range. One of those mountain peaks is called Monte Ceceri. And today it's a very scenic and worthwhile hiking trail for those of you who are going to visit Florence that want to put on your hiking legs take the, the trip to Fiesole and hike the trail of Monte Ceceri. Should you hike to the top of Monte Ceceri, you will see the plaque that marks the location where Leonardo famously threw an assistant off of the mountain in one of his flying machines. The truth is, as far as I can tell, that the machine worked as a glider. That means that it carried his assistant from the top to the bottom, but never gained altitude. So it's not technically flight. I hear mixed reports about what his assistant broke upon landing, but I think it was his legs. Can you imagine being that guy? In my brain, Leonardo is this mad inventor, so whoever would strap into his crazy winged contraption and jump off of a mountain must be a few scooty short of a florin, if you catch my meaning. <laughs> that would be Renaissance Florentine currency. Scooty and florins. I think there's a bunch more, but I don't know them all. Much like his spinning horse chariot blades, he also dreamed up what would be likened to modern helicopters. Also, movable wall fortifications, and any number of air or hydraulic-based machines, be it for war, everyday life, or otherwise. Most of them never came to be in his time or would not have worked at all if you look at the designs. But if you go to the castle in the town of Vinci, they have attempted to create his inventions and demonstrate them. It's an exciting and worthwhile visit after your hike to Monte Ceceri to get some transport to the town of Vinci to the Leonardo's uh, Inventions Machines Museum. I don't know what it's called. Machines Museum? That's definitely not it. So you can't miss it. It's in a castle. Let's circle back then. Try to consolidate these many trails of thought. Leonardo da Vinci was an absolute monumental figure in the development of Renaissance art. He popularized the intense focus on art as a reproduction of nature, urging the artists who followed him to be more nature-focused as well, removing Renaissance art further from its medieval predecessor, which was generally not incapable of producing natural-looking images, but uninterested in it in favor of a more devotional pictorial mode. He urged artists to look to the natural world and to reproduce it in their works, and further develop technique in order to do so our much-discussed sfumato technique. For as much of a success as Leonardo was, he had many shortcomings, from failed inventions to having more incomplete or ruined works than those that ever came to finish, 
uh, either to his or his patron's satisfaction. In the very least, we can dispel some myth around Leonardo and call him genius, but a fallible human just like the rest of us. Can we agree on that? I think so. I want to thank you all again for joining me today on the Italian Renaissance podcast. The truth is, you can spend a lifetime discussing this man. But I hope this serves as a valuable introductory conversation. And overall, I think it was a very fruitful discussion on Leonardo da Vinci. If you thought so too, please rate this podcast wherever you are listening and subscribe so you're notified when the next episode comes out. Until then, wishing you all wonderful Renaissance endeavors. Alla prossima!